Thank you. Thank you, Laura. And here are my um, declarations. Oh. So, so I'm going to talk about, so the title is Long-Acting Injectables, Where Might They Fit? And if I translate that into English, it means how will we use them in the real world, which then means how generalizable are clinical trial data, which then begs the question, who was excluded from the trials? Um, so, and, and just to set the scene, the, the, the pivotal trials for long-acting was, of course, as Sharon uh, said, and thank you very much for showing the slides, Atlas and Flair, and the list of exclusions was quite large. So women who are pregnant or breastfeeding, anyone with significant cardiac disease, anyone with an EGFR less than 50, any cancers, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, oh dear, excuse me, how do I go back? Can I go back? Yep. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, injectables, uh, where they might fit, and then I'm going to, I think, try and make this a bit more interactive, so I'll re rely on people like Jonathan, uh, if no one else talks, I'll pick on you um, uh, uh, with some case histories and say, would you consider long-acting in this patient or not? Um, and then I'm going to talk about drug interactions because actually they're going to be, in some senses, uh, uh, long-acting injections remove some drug interactions, but they actually add some new ones as well, uh, which may not be immediately obvious to a lot of people, uh, and uh, we'll see how far we get with that. So let's start. You'll have heard about, uh, obviously, carbotagravir and rilpivirine, but there are other long actings in the mix, and it depends on what you mean by long, rather like Anton's rapid. Um, so some people would regard seven days as long. I don't think that we would nowadays, but there are already licensed drugs, so l is, uh, is 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 licensed uh, in, in Russia, uh, albuvitide in China, which is parenteral, uh, and uh, Islatrovir is being... Uh, uh, has been tested uh, as, a, as a daily, but is increasingly going into a, 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 a weekly uh, trial with deravarine, and I think we discussed that. Um, and then long-acting, we really mean 28 days or longer, if preferable, two months or three months, and where we've got uh, is uh, capitagravir and rilpivirine, uh, but also VRCO1 and the LS, which we talked about, is Latrovir, which Sharon has mentioned, and some new drugs uh, and TAF implants coming up, which I've already mentioned earlier on today. So just to recap, uh, capitagravir is rather like dolotegravir. It's... Uh, primarily metabolized by glucuronidation, UGT1A1, uh, which means that it's liver metabolized, it should be okay in renal impairment, uh, and that even in advanced liver disease, glucuronidation is fairly maintained, uh, much longer than uh, cytochrome P450s, for example, so it should be okay in those um, patients. Uh, we talked about the long detectable tail, I won't go into that again, rilpivirine, a 3A4 substrate, a drug that we know very well, uh, and the issue around the long acting is that it requires a cold chain, which may be a problem, particularly when you start to look at difficult to reach populations and whether district nurses can go out and give injections to people at home or in prisons, and then you're starting to think, well, where's the fridge uh, in the back of the car and things like that. So, very quickly to pass through l sulfavine um, so it's got market authorization in Russia. It's, a, it's an NNRTI, it's a pro-drug. The active metabolite has a half-life of eight days. And although the pivotal trial that uh, got it its license in Russia was on daily dosing, it's now being uh, compared, uh, in, assessed in weekly dosing, uh, and also a subcut formulation uh, is in development. Remember what we said about subcut this morning and how preferable if it was associated with fewer uh, injection site reactions it would be to, to IM delivery. Albuvatide is a drug which is licensed in China, and it is a fusion inhibitor, and it is given by an intravenous infusion once a week. And the data that uh, got it its license was the talent study, but actually that's never really been substantively published. In interim data were presented in Glasgow in 2016, uh, and the full study has not, to my knowledge, uh, been published. Uh, but uh, it, the, the problem with this drug is the comparator was lopinavir, not a drug that we use a lot of nowadays, not certainly your go-to drug, uh, and uh, the, the uh, uh, control arm was combivir and lopinavir, which shows you, I guess, how old this uh, study was. 
Uh, it's being explored in countries other than China, so I think Russia uh, is being looked at, and then there's a, a study looking at combining albuvatide with a broadly neutralizing antibody. Isatravir, shouted, is a, is, a, is a particularly exciting drug. It's exciting because the uh, data on oral use has come out. It's very potent. Um, uh, but it's being looked at in different ways. So, so it's being looked at daily with doravarine, which is some of the data you saw, but also weekly, uh, and potentially a parenteral formulation is being developed for, for use in implant, uh, both in PrEP and in treatment. And, uh, and you can see here, uh, these are data in the, in the last year, uh, where, where you've, got, you've got a whole host of different mutations um, uh, and 3TC activity is lost as with, as with other nucleosides that uh, sensitivity to islatrovir is retained. A drug, I think, that is much further down the line, so, it, it, so, so uh, really only entering uh, clinical development, uh, is a very interesting drug, and this is uh, GS6207. This is a capsid assembly inhibitor, uh, and, and it acts at multiple points in the viral life cycle, suggesting again that actually resistance will be just that little bit harder to get across, so that's a good thing. But the really interesting thing about this drug is its activity. So we're used to, you know, we, we, when protease inhibitors came along, we had drugs at last uh, with micromolar activity, and that was so exciting. Uh, and then in the last uh, five, 10 years, we've been used to drugs that have um, nanomolar activity. Uh, and now we've got a drug with picomolar activity. So this means that the pill size is compact, but it means it's really, really potent. And you can see the potency uh, down here in comparison to some of the other new drugs. Um, and and that, that potency is retained across clade. So I think this will be a really interesting drug. Um, with everything, there is a downside. The downside here is that it's poorly soluble. So it's not going to be an easy drug to administer orally. But that is, on the reverse side, it's going to be, if injected, uh, something that's going to be very poorly soluble, so it's going to have a long tissue half-life, uh, and that's exactly what you want in a long-acting uh, injectable. You want a drug that is very poorly soluble. Uh, and surprise, surprise, the half-life is about a month, so that's fantastic. So I think we need to watch this. Uh, obviously, there's many a slip between the cup and the lip, um, but this is a drug that we should keep an eye on. I've talked about VRCO1 already. I'm not going to talk any more about it. So we're on to long actings. Where might they fit? So the pros and cons are slightly different to that in PrEP, which we discussed this morning. So clearly, it takes adherence off the table. That's fantastic. Convenience is great. Um, the great attraction for long acting uh, drugs is, is the ability to target fragile populations, people who don't engage with care, uh, uh, and, 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 and people who, uh, for whom there's still a lot of stigma attached with the daily pill taking. But a lot of these patients, a lot of these populations were actually excluded from the clinical trial. So I think we need to, we need to think hard about, about how we can use these. Uh, this psychological benefit, clearly, there's, um, Privacy benefits, you, people don't see you taking the tablets every day. It eliminates gut-based adverse effects and drug interactions. So all your, um, uh, um, multi, uh, your, your, your divalent cations or your PPIs, uh, and it eliminates food effects. So uh, quite attractive on the face of it. Now, we talk about pill fatigue, but actually, I'm sure that with increasing use, we will start to encounter this thing called injection fatigue, uh, and we have injection site reactions. So that's clearly, the, 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 as Sharon said, people were going there hoping to get an injection, and those are the key words here. Um, it's resource intensive in terms of delivery. We've talked about that. We talked about how to manage the tail. Well, we haven't really talked about managing tail because we're still not yet clear how we do that or how we manage new events um, and drug interactions. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So I'll just launch now into a couple of case histories and then maybe we can use these to talk about how we would use long acting injectables in practice. So here is. 
The first patient, this is a genuine real patient of ours in Liverpool, um, and she's got a long history of, uh, of um, attention deficit disorder. She has got a lot of trouble with, has been in multiple care homes since the age of five, L a lot of learning difficulties, extremely poor adherence and use of alcohol and recreational drugs. And then in 2015, there's a history of she presents with STIs and has a new HIV diagnosis. And the, the nature of her story uh, and the number of her partners uh, made us suggest and indeed she uh, uh, made us suspect and indeed she confirmed it that she was, uh, she was intermittently engaged in sex work. There were many, many discussions, many starts at trying to take antiretroviral therapy with a lot of community support, uh, but really a very chaotic lifestyle, and she simply forgot. Uh, she's not opposed to taking pills. Um, <clears throat> and you can see the, the past history of Truvada and booster Darunavir, diarrhea, too much trouble, uh, Triamec, uh, didn't agree with her cannabis. Uh, Resolstra, poor adherence. Genvoya, poor adherence. Uh, and again, we were trying to keep the pill numbers down to an absolute minimum, uh, uh, but even then she didn't even take enough drug to develop any resistance. So actually that, was, that tells you quite a lot about this lady. So my question to you is, would she be a candidate for long acting? So here is her CD4 count, still pretty high, but going down. That's her viral load, uh, never really uh, meaningfully uh, been suppressed. So how many people here would think she's a candidate for a long acting injection? Nobody. Nobody. No. Nope. Candidate, but I'm, I'm. The problem is that what happens after the first injection? <laughs> All right. So, does she ever come back for any more? Yeah. And that's when. So when she's someone who would have been excluded from Atlas, right? Yeah. And Flair, uh, 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 right from the but start. I'd offer her the choice. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, so I think so it's a good question. I, I guess my um, my key uh, parameter here is her CD4 count. This woman is not in imminent danger right now. So we're not, we don't have a situation where if we don't start treating her today, she'll get HIV. So in the, in the olden days, we would say this woman has issues which are treatable. I mean, a lot of us drink and use cannabis, you know, I mean, and have learning difficulties. There seems to be a real social issue here, which is, I mean, all those toxicities, it just sounds like before, this would be a woman which with good, intense social services, we might still be able to get her to take one pill once a day. And I don't think yet. Now, if I had the same case, let's say we had this patient and she has a CD4 count of 20, and she's had a couple of OIs. I think that would be a, an interesting consideration. I think the risk benefit then, and as Anton said, she may get one drug and one dose and leave. But if you have a patient who really is beginning to get sick and doesn't have options, I think the risk benefit change, then maybe then it would be worth the risk. I don't know, I have it here with others. Okay. Okay. So we, we took the view that actually the urgency here was the, um, was the treatment as prevention aspect rather than the fact she needed antiretroviral therapy. Sorry, Dan. Yeah, so I, I would uh, come to the same conclusion as Jonathan, but for a different reason. I think the big issue is about uh, assuring that she returns for follow-up visits. And, uh, you know, injectables have the potential for directly observed therapy, but we don't have the mechanism for delivering the directly observed therapy, right? And that's the big challenge, because if people disappear from clinic uh, periodically, which is really what happens with our non-adherent patients who have chaotic lifestyles, then you, then you have this risk of this long tail. And I, I think if you could assure that this person would either come back to clinic or could be brought back to clinic on a regular basis, then absolutely I would use injectables in her. But we don't have the uh, agreement yet that that's uh, in the public health interest to do so. Yep. Uh, and absent that infrastructure, I think it's a real challenge. So she community support that was intensive, that, required, that was based at treatments, community delivered treatment at home. So we asked Vive, we said, uh, would you consider it? Uh, and they said, yeah. So. We did. We gave it to her, and there was a whole issue about how do you give rilpivirine, uh, uh, how long is the cold chain intact for, how do you get it around the back of a car. Um, uh, and thus far, touch wood, uh, she has suppressed 
successfully. And I think the community benefits here are obvious. The personal benefits, I hope, are obvious, but the sustainability is up for grabs. I think that's as, uh, I'm not presenting this as a success story. I could come back in a year's time and tell you a very different uh, tale. So again, what if she stops attending or what if she becomes pregnant? So is she someone who's refused an implant? So I think that's going to be quite an interesting discussion uh, and maybe we can talk about that later on. So I'll give you another case uh, and then we'll wrap up with drug interaction. So this is another patient who's not atypical for most of us. So a 65 year old man, elderly, uh, been perfectly adherent, uh, been under our care for years and years, uh, and, and as he ages, he collects multiple comorbidities, initially anxiety, depression, and then cardiac disease, so someone else who would have been, been excluded from, from, from atlas and flare, prosthetism, chronic kidney disease, and you can see the southward trajectory of his EGFR, um, and then he presents with frailty, falls, weight loss, sarcopenia, and poor memory. So he's, gonna, he's getting into a frailty, multi-morbid phenotype. And he's starting to get blips, which makes you suggest that actually his memory is not as good as it used to be, uh, and that he uh, is missing uh, treatments. And he's on the usual suspects of, uh, of co-meds, so a bit of amlodipine, a statin, uh, the calcitu and the lansoprazole, okay, so the PPI and some, some metals floating around, uh, and then citalopram, prostate things, and aspirin. And has been on a lot of, uh, has been on prior regimens before, so atazanivir-based regimen intolerance because of jaundice, lopinavir, uh, and tenofovir uh, in 2007, but the declining renal function uh, switched over to um, Kyvexa and Darunavir, and then uh, um, Kyvexa, Darunavir, Cobicistat, so Resolstra. Okay, so he comes back in 2019 and he's got this neurocognitive impairment. So on the face of that, that would be pretty good, actually. Neurocognitive impairment leading to slightly worse adherence. So that would be a good ca uh, candidate for, 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 for long-acting, right? Okay. He's got multiple morbidities. So you've got long-acting drugs with very low propensity for um, drug interactions, and particularly um, uh, the long-acting gut-based drug interactions. So he's on uh, a PPI and he's on uh, calcitriptyl. So actually, um, the injections would, would, would take those off the table that we, that we find. Multiple DDIs. Sarcopenia, is that, is that a, uh, what do you feel about sarcopenia in injections? Sarcopenia, it might be very difficult then. <laughs> And if he has buttock sarcopenia? Well, then it's, it's a new term. Difficult. I must use yeah. it more often. Yeah. <laughs> well, it'd be more difficult for him to have the injections. It'd be much more painful, and uh, it may put him off if, if he gets a lot of pain. And but, also, it depends yeah. where the injection... If he's got no muscle, he's probably got no fat over the top, too. So, Is it a deal-breaker? I don't think it's a deal-breaker, but it, you, you could try it and see how he is after it. But okay. uh, that's the problem. Local anaesthetic, yeah. yep. With children, we use the ceftriaxone together in combination with local anaesthetic. Okay. okay. All right. I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I, personally, I think it probably isn't a deal breaker if the patient's willing to try it. But as you say, you just try it, and then if they, they tolerate it, that's, that's fine. All right, so then he, suppose he comes in in 2019 with a, a, a brainstem CVA. So he's got swallowing difficulties, a uh, bit of aspiration, and he's got fast AF. Uh, and you start dabigatran. Okay, swallowing difficulties, so no car, your oral lead in. Problem with oral lead in? Happy to go straight for IM? Yep, okay, accumulating data. In the expanded access program, there is some, there's some data, isn't there? Yeah, okay. All right, um, dabigatran, right. So you're on anticoagulation, uh, and every, every month, every couple of months, you're injecting a, 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 a deep IM injection. Deal breaker or not? No, who says not? Who says yes? So it's three mils, you're three mils of injection in, in your buttock, each buttock, um, and, and you're gonna bleed, yeah? the hemophilia clinic, we have hemophiliacs. And this is a, a, uh, a concern. Is it a deal breaker in someone like this who doesn't have very many other options? 
And the question is, can you manage in patients who have uh, bleeding abnormalities like hemophiliacs or who are getting these drugs, uh, IM injections? So in, the, in this gentleman altogether, I'm still not convinced with the sarcopenia, I guess that's not exactly the term I'm concerned with. We're more with, with the fat. I guess you could have sarcopenia and still have fat, as, as Anton was bringing up. So we've been surprised that we've been able in patients with a lot of bleeding abnormalities, if it's, you're not as worried about people bleeding IM as you are into other places in the body. So it wouldn't be a deal breaker, it would have to be dealt with, but I think that's not necessarily a deal breaker. Although I don't know, maybe you have data differently. But, but your hemophiliac patients are not getting injections every month, are they? Well, it depends. Sometimes they need to. You know, so if you're doing two injections, diseases. one in each well, muscle every month. Yeah, well, this is actually, this is not a hemophiliac. This is actually easier. This is a drug where you can actually deal with it a little bit. Yeah. So it's, it's a little bit different. And again, it depends into which compartment. Into the CNS, we would never take any chances. But in bleeding into muscle, you can sometimes deal with it. So I don't know what happened in this patient. it be interesting to see. Okay. You can bleed quite a lot into muscle as uh, fractures show. It's not just the individual risk of the bleed, it's the monthly, it's a monthly uh, I, exposure. I would be quite concerned for two reasons. One, uh, how many times do you want to inject into the, the pelvis, right, into the ischium, because you're going straight through muscle, <laughs> given his sarcopenia. Uh, and secondly, uh, with the, the bleeding risk, I think, you know, the hemophiliacs are at least getting factor eight. Uh, this guy, you're doing the opposite. You're trying to actually promote a uh, prolonged bleeding time. Um, in order to protect him from uh, stroke, a uh, recurrent stroke, uh, because of his atrial fibrillation. And so, um, yeah, I, I would think that uh, anticoagulation is a relative contraindication to intramuscular, regular intramuscular injection. Can I, can I say, can you give this intravenously instead? Ooh. <laughs> no. But then, but then, in a way, his multiple other medications need to be administered as well. And you're probably going to have to go for something like a PEG tube in this man, because you're not going to have any long-acting versions of everything else. So why would you? Uh, so, so for, for most of these drugs, he isn't getting. Uh, so he's got the anticoagulation uh, with that. Uh, uh, so, so I. I, I so he needs a definitive yeah, solution. Yeah, he, he does need a definitive solution. Yeah. The, the reason I asked about the IV wasn't about the long acting. It was that what IV preparations have we got for this guy? Okay, because he's you can't give IM. It, uh, yeah, you'd have to put a tube in if you're going to. And then we don't know about the absorption of a lot of drugs that yeah, way. So, so we'd have to, yeah. So I was just wondering whether uh, there's an IV preparation of. of well, you, you can get A Z T IV. <laughs> Generation T20. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. although there's no evidence, I think what Frontier did is they have a very close mimicking of that. I forget the number it was, and it's actually available. And Frontier is very nine. open. And I've, 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 you know, got it for patients mm -hmm. in Asia. So it seems to be, as you said, you know, we don't know, say, how good it is, but if you have no other options and people mm -hmm. are coming in, it seems to be pretty safe, like T20. Yeah. But what about sticking stuff in? But he can't swallow. Um, so, so he actually, he actually. So this was this was an acute situation. So he's actually his swallowing is much better now. Um, but but his memory hasn't changed. So we just, I'm just. And, we have and, the <laughs> and the anticoagulation bit hasn't changed. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move on, I think, in the interest of time, but, um, but thanks for all those comments. So, and, and then I threw in, this didn't actually happen, but I threw in, what if he has post-ictal, uh, post-stroke seizures, and he started on an epi anti-epileptic, and then what, how are you going to manage the um, long-acting? Okay, and the, and, the, and the interesting thing is that I've given you a, a, a drug which is not like phenytoin, which is a potent inducer, but this is a moderate inducer. Uh, and the relevance here is that for, for moderate inducers like rifabutin, uh, you can double dose oral tablets to get over it, but there's no way you can dose adapt for an, in, uh, for an injectable drug, okay? So, let's very, m I've got a minute left, and I'm sorry I've overrun. Uh, I'm gonna quickly talk about drug interactions with long-acting. So, we know that, uh, we, it's been said that 
cohorts are getting older, we've got polypharmacy, we've got multi-morbidity, that's clear. Uh, and we also know that multiple morbidities don't, are, are not randomly thrown away, they cluster. And so there are any number of studies that show this in the non-HIV uh, setting, but in the HIV, uh, the HIV cohort setting, these are data from Poppy, uh, which have a, a, a group of uh, HIV positive patients over 50, um, uh, HIV negative people over 50, and HIV positive people under 50. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a large study, uh, and there are effectively four um, uh, comorbidity clusters. The cardiometabolic cluster, so cardiovascular disease, angina, hypertension, with metabolic disorders, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and dyslipidemia. A mental health, depression, chronic pain, anxiety cluster, uh, and an STD cluster. So if you look at these clusters, and we know that this is fairly repeatable across different populations, uh, and this is work that uh, uh, Sarah Gibbons in our group has done and is being presented at EACS uh, this week. So if you look at the Liverpool database um, of, uh, of, and you look at these clusters, the mental health cluster, the cardiovascular cluster, and the metabolic cluster, the, intra, the, ins, the, uh, the prevalence of um, drug interactions is high with the old boosted regimens, so boosted PIs and, uh, uh, and boosted l vitegravir okay? And if you look at the modern regimens now, and it doesn't matter which modern regimen, whether you're looking at uh, Eviplera of DEFC, uh, uh, they are all considerably lower. So, so the relative risk of a clinically significant drug interaction, that's to say an AMBO or RED, the relative risk of a drug interaction is that much lower now. And actually, two drug regimens don't decrease it anymore, and injectables don't decrease it anymore. So by all means, go for those regimens. There are arguments for that. But reducing drug interactions isn't really one of them. The relative risk of drug interactions has dropped. The absolute risk of drug interactions has not. So this is a, a bubble plot that we uh, that we did. This is a just to give you that. That's about sample size of about a hundred odd. Um, that's about uh, four thousand, and that's about twenty three thousand. So you can look at the um, instance of drug interactions across the years by uh, European, orange, uh, African, blue, or U.S. Uh, red, and you can see that the interactions have really not changed much, and that's because people have got older. And interestingly, in 2019, your risk of developing clinically significant interactions seems to be very much linked to how much integrases you use. So in high integrase using cohorts, the, the, the risk of a clinically significant drug interaction is much lower than in other countries where, uh, uh, like Barcelona and in UK, where the integrase use was much lower. All right. So, I'm going to finish with two slides, and these are two slides that uh, you should never show, and I'm going to remove this from the slide deck. Uh, these are what I think the label is going to, uh, <laughs> the label might look like. Don't take a picture, please, and do not tweet this. Uh, so this breaks every regulatory rule, uh, and I'm going to th show you what I think the drug interactions potential will look like for CAB and for Rolpivirine, or in other words, how it would differ. So if you've got gut-based interactions, multivitamins, acid-reducing agents, and actually rilpivirine, uh, the, 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 the IM version is going to get rid of all that. Okay? If you've got strong inducers, they're going to wipe everything out. And I think that there's good uh, uh, data on oral CAB and model data using PBPK modeling for IM CAB that suggests that's the case. We talked about moderate inducers and how you can do that. So with rifabutin, I talked about doubling up the dose of some drugs where you can't do that if it's injected. Uh, and then we talked a, bit, a little bit about the anticoagulation. So I think those are problems. Um, what will they look like in special populations, which is well, fragile populations, which is what we said. So if pregnancy is not a fragile population, but what would it look like? At least we know for rilpivirine that there's some reasonable data emerging from APR, uh, that there's no safety signal with uh, oral rilpivirine, chronic renal impairment, and chronic liver disease. So we can, we can presuppose uh, uh, safety in, 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 in the IM version. So I'm going to summarize now, uh, and because I've gone past my time. So th th there is no doubt that for other diseases, particularly chronic mental health uh, diseases, that, that IM injections, long-acting IM injections, think about uh, aripiprazole, think about peliperidrone, um, it has been transformative. 
And the expectation is that it, can put, it has the potential to be transformative. But patient selection is the key to this. Uh, and don't forget that there are long-acting orals, and we talked a little bit about some of them, uh, and, 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 and that there are long-acting devices as well, the, the implants, for example, uh, uh, um, uh, transcutaneous delivery through microneedles is something that's being looked at, uh, causing some excitement. Um, many unanswered questions, and I think the, the issue here is that when, when, when these drugs uh, are licensed eventually, there's going to have to be some investment from the companies involved to look at phase four and how the, the, the populations who were rightly excluded from the earlier trials are, are, are covered. Thank you. <laughs>